America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. We shall never surrender. The year is 1940, and the skies over Britain are filled with Germans. And despite the chaps in the RAF giving the Jerrys a run for their money, the cupboards at home are bare. Welcome to the War Kitchen, where we cover the recipes and cookery that sustained nations during conflicts and times of hardship around the world. In this first episode, we will cover one of the most well-known recipes, the Woolton Pie. This recipe was part of a series of recipes developed by the British government during World War II as a way of feeding the masses with as little resources as possible, while still being nutritious and flavorful. We'll dive into the history in just a second, but first we've got some shopping to do. The original recipe, as taken from official documents and publications of the time, is as follows. One pound each of potatoes, cauliflower, carrots, and swedes, which we Americans might know as rutabagas, but can also be used to refer to turnips. Three or four spring onions or powdered onion, if possible one teaspoon of vegetable extract, one tablespoon of oatmeal, and finally wheat meal or flour. Alright, so when getting our shopping list together, we've got to clear a few things up and make a few substitutions for our modern times. Rutabagas and turnips, while extremely common and widely used in a lot of English cooking, especially at the time, these aren't exactly as commonly used in recipes over here in the United States these days. So if you don't particularly like them, you can leave them out and substitute with something else. What is very common in the United States these days is cabbage. Cabbage is normally overlooked by a lot of people in the US because many people just don't care for it. As a result, cabbage can be found in pretty much every grocery store in the United States, usually for really cheap. And since not that many people like it, cabbage can usually still be found during food shortages. When it comes to the measurements in the original recipe, the amounts listed are kind of a lot for filling a modern pie dish. So you can reduce the amounts depending on what other ingredients you choose to add or leave out. The great part about these kinds of recipes is that they are very adaptable based on your taste or what ingredients you can actually find, which is important for the most critical part of any meat or, sadly, meatless pie, the crust. If you prefer the classic shepherd's pie tactic of spooning mashed potatoes on the top, you can do this and call it a day. Or you can make a simple crust by hand. Or you can do what we did and do both. As it is common among most historical cookery, the recipe gets a bit vague and can vary depending on which version of the Woolton pie you are trying to make. Here's the recipe that we followed and it turned out quite nicely. Firstly, dice up all of your potatoes and other ingredients into small pieces. Remember, the entire point of this recipe is to conserve resources. So by cutting smaller pieces instead of larger chunks, we'll reduce the time it takes to cook, conserving fuel or electricity. Also, make sure to use a pot lid as this will drastically reduce both your cooking time and the energy needed to cook the vegetables. Cook all of this together for 10 minutes with just enough water to cover everything. Once it comes to a simmer, you can keep it there until the vegetables are tender. For the size of pie that we made, this took about 20 minutes. Remember to occasionally stir the mixture to prevent sticking, but make sure to do it gently so as to not mash the vegetables too much. Once the vegetables are almost done, you can add some spices if you have them. Salt has historically 
historically been a highly prized commodity, and in this recipe, it's most certainly valuable. So we'll add in a large pinch of salt. You can also add in a pinch of ground pepper at this stage if you wish. Usually most recipes call for adding pepper last since it can burn, but in boiled dishes like this one, it doesn't really matter. We'll also add in a teaspoon of onion powder, which was part of the original recipe from the war, but if you'd like, you can substitute this for garlic powder if you'd like. Or add both, it's up to you and what you actually like to eat. And finally, we can bring the flavor to this dish by adding a bouillon cube or two. For our recipe, we ended up using two regular chicken bouillon cubes as we were seeking to emulate a chicken pie. You can use really any flavoring you'd like, but when it comes to a meatless pie, it's less obvious that there's no meat in it if you stick to a chicken flavoring. If you were to use a beef flavor, you can obviously tell there's no meat in it. Also, you can follow the original recipe and add in a tablespoon of oats at this point. This is solely meant to act as a thickening agent so that everything comes together nicely. If you don't have oats, don't worry, it's not super important. Plus, your bouillon cubes will certainly thicken things up quite a bit. So once you've finished adding in your flavorings, keep a sharp eye on the mixture to prevent it from sticking and burning. If you timed it right, your mixture should be starting to thicken up right as your vegetables become tender. If not, again, don't worry. Just keep cooking and stirring everything until it's done. Again, taking care to not mash the vegetables too much. Once that's done, remove from the heat and set aside to continue thickening up while we make the crust. For a single crust, for a normal 9-inch pie dish, combine two cups of whatever flour you can find with two teaspoons of baking powder, using just enough water to make a nice thick dough. Some versions of the original recipe also called for adding in four tablespoons or half a stick of butter to the dough mixture. So you can add this in if you have it. If you don't, don't worry about it. Remember, always add your liquid ingredients to the flour slowly. Otherwise, you'll have clumps and will be forced to knead the dough too much. Once you've got your dough, you can use a rolling pin to roll it out to fit your pie dish. Or you can just use your hands like we did. We're not trying to be fancy here. We're trying to feed as many people as possible with few resources. So if it doesn't look worthy of a Michelin star, don't sweat it. Now, if you are American and prefer crust on the bottom and on the top, what we call the right way, just double the ingredients for your crust and make two of them, one for the bottom and one for the top. For this version, we split the difference. Keeping one crust for the bottom and taking advantage of leftovers from the day before, we spooned mashed potatoes over the top in the traditional manner. This worked out quite well and saved some food that otherwise might have been thrown out. But if you don't have any leftovers, you can easily mash up an extra potato and spread it over the top if you wish to copy the mashed potatoes on top, crust on the bottom technique that we did. So once your pie is all ready to bake, throw it in the oven and bake it for 30 minutes at 375 degrees. Or until until the top gets golden brown. And while that's off to bake, let's take a look at the history behind the dish that defined a nation. While the credit for the creation of this magnificent recipe goes to the Savoy Hotel in London, the true namesake of this dish is none other than Lord Woolton, otherwise known as Frederick Marquis, the first Earl of Woolton. Becoming the Minister of Food for the United Kingdom during World War II, he and others were given the difficult task of managing food resources for the island nation. And with the British Isles staring down a naval blockade that heavily restricted trade from her overseas empire, Lord Woolton and his staff were highly motivated to do more with less when it comes to the nutritional needs of a populace at war. And one of these solutions that has forever immortalized its creator is the Woolton Pie. This recipe was the cornerstone of a whole series of recipes that were created by the British government that were intended to maximize every possible resource. Meat being in short supply and what little meat there was being allocated to military rations, citizens on the home front had to innovate in order to turn somewhat bland ingredients into something more edible. It is true that Britain did not face sheer starvation like other nations did during the war but the limitations and rationing of certain foods meant that pressure was placed on British citizens to do more with less. And as we all know, innovation in the face of adversity yields superhuman results, such as creating a meat pie without using meat and still have it taste pretty good. Maybe not the best, but certainly good enough to add variety to what otherwise would have been a bland diet. And that really is the legacy of the Woolton pie. Good, not great. 
Once the war was over, the Woolton Pie was something that the British population was happy to forget. People found that the Woolton Pie just wasn't that tasty. It was good, and a quite impressive way to make something without using critical wartime resources, but after a while it got kind of bland and boring. And that's how our own recipe turned out. Most people who try this recipe today seem to come to the conclusion that they could eat it for years if necessary in the event that meat becomes a rare commodity, but it would certainly benefit from having some real meat in it. This was a dish of hardship, and even outright desperation. Not one that a population is eager to keep eating once the hardship is over. But in today's world, this recipe is extremely valuable. From Bond villain billionaires to crumbling infrastructure, food shortages are becoming much more of a concern for many Americans. And with powerful people taking cues from the pages of dystopian novels to denounce beef, we might find ourselves having to dust off these recipes from hard times of the past in order to survive the hard times that have yet to come.